Hi, everybody. I'm Brian Williams. It is my pleasure to welcome you to the 1993 Thoroughbred Racing Season here at Woodbine. In just three years, the world will leave the United States, the world of horse racing, that is, and come to Canada for the first time as Woodbine will host the Breeders' Cup. And as we begin a new season and look ahead to 96, I think it's only appropriate that we begin it under the watchful eyes of the man whose foresight and vision has made it all possible. That, of course, is the great E.P. Taylor. Over the years, I have been fortunate to work seven different Olympic Games. I've worked in every major sport in this country, from hockey to baseball, football, skiing, car racing. Yet some of my favorite memories are from right here at Woodbine. I think back to 1973, the rain and the sleet, Big Red Secretariat's final appearance. We'll see that in just a minute. Go back just one year ago. The story at the Breeders at Gulfstream, of course, was AP Indy. Remember, AP Indy was beaten in the Molson Million here in 1992. And memories concern not just personalities on the track, great racehorses, but how about the owners, the jockeys, the trainers from every racing center in the world. And what about you people, the fans, and your enjoyment of royalty? Royalty has been a very important part of the history and tradition of this great facility. There's no question, Woodbine has a very special history and a very special tradition. And as we begin a new racing season in 1993, let's reflect on the history and tradition of this great facility. And of course, when you do that, you begin with the vision and foresight of E.P. Taylor. It was called the Giant of the North. How prophetic those words would become. Woodbine, sitting majestically on then barren flatland in northwest Toronto, was officially opened on June 12th of 1956. Then Premier Leslie Frost was joined by George C. Hendrick, president of the Ontario Jockey Club, and by Mr. E.P. Taylor. E.P. Taylor had torn down Dufferin and Long Branch racetracks in Toronto, as well as tracks in Hamilton and Niagara Falls. It was called the Leaky Roof Circuit, and Taylor, better than anyone, had realized it simply could not be patched. He built this five-level, red brick, white stucco and glass monument to thoroughbred racing. His dream was to build a track with facilities for horses and fans, second to none. He wanted a track which would attract the superstars of international racing. Even Mr. Taylor could not have imagined in his wildest dreams that Woodbine would become one of the most well-known tracks in the entire world of racing. Woodbine took its name from the original track which was constructed on the shores of Lake Ontario at Ashbridge's Bay on the Queen's Road. It was a dusty, horse-drawn carriage ride from the heart of Toronto. That track, built by Joseph Dugan, was falling on hard times when the newly constituted Ontario Jockey Club was formed way back in 1881. They leased the track for $2,000 a year. The foundations of that original track are buried under tons of concrete, but a portion of the old stand would shake from the cheering in 1939 when King George VI and Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth were drawn by horse and carriage down the stretch. The specter of war in Europe was growing, but those cares were packed away at least for a day. The day the King and Queen witnessed the 80th running of the King's Plate won by George McCullough's archwork. It was the first visit by a reigning monarch to witness the race which Queen Victoria had sanctioned in 1860. When Mr. Taylor began restructuring racing in the early 1950s, it was evident that Woodbine could no longer showcase the best racing in Canada. The city was quite simply pushing in from all sides. Lakeshore Road would cut a swath to the south, cutting off the stabling areas from the lake where horsemen would often swim their horses to maintain a fitness level while avoiding that heavy pounding from training on the track. Thus, a new Woodbine would begin to take shape first in Mr. Taylor's mind and then on the architect's drawing board. No question, Avelino Gomez was the riding star of the early years here at Woodbine. His was a flamboyant style, and that Spanish blood would often run hot. He was a fan favorite, a superstar who passed on his will to win to such up-and-coming stars as Ron Turcotte and then Sandy Hall. I remember it so well. Gomez died tragically following an accident during the 1980 running of the Canadian Oaks. And each year on Oaks Day here at Woodbine, Memories of Avellino are recalled. 
a statue of the Hall of Famer salutes each generation of jockey as they parade postward from the paddock. A good friend of mine, Jim Coleman, one of Canada's best loved columnists, talked with Gomez about the early years on Woodbine's 25th anniversary in 1980. Ironically, the interview was done just days before his death. Well, looking back over all the years here, when you, in which you dominated Canadian racing entirely for so many years, what was the best horse you rode around Woodbine? In Canada, Victoria Price, no doubt about that. There's no doubt in my mind, because I never was in Northern Dancing. I no. cannot judge Northern Dancing beside what I see in the record. But the best horse in Canada was Victoria Price, no doubt about it. No. No question about it. True, well, everything the Northern Dancy did. I still maintain that the fastest horse ever bred in Canada was Victoria Park. Well, the faster, yes and no. Okay. I say yes and no, and those years, yes, and today, it's a lot of good as today. Look, that Canadian bred breeder is right on top of the wall. So, you know. Well, let's just remember one thing. Victoria Park set track records at Hialeah and at Delaware Park that still exist today. And still here, mile and a quarter, and we play. Mile and a quarter. Two. Yeah, I remember them trying to flag you down. Yeah, right, yeah, right. Victoria Park had blazed a path for future Canadian stars in the American three-year-old classics. Probably would have won the Belmont Stakes in 1960, but Mr. Taylor elected to bring the Big Bay home to run in the Queen's Plate. Run and win he did with Avelino Gomez sticking his tongue out at a would-be assassin who had threatened to shoot the Cuban star right out of the saddle. Four years later, Northern Dancer, a Canadian sports legend, made a triumphant return here to Woodbine, having won the Kentucky Derby and the Preakness. He was the first Canadian bred to win the first two jewels in the American Triple Crown. Northern Dancer's return to Woodbine for the Queen's Plate touched off an outpouring of emotion and adoring fans lined the walking ring as the chunky colt pranced and preened. He did just that on the track as well. Jockey Bill Hartak, who had guided the son of Nearctic to victory in the Derby and the Preakness, would milk the moment. Hartak took the dancer in hand until to the dismay of the Queen's Plate crowd, he was inhaling the dust of the field. Northern Dancer would have none of that. And when Bill Hartak gave the signal to run, Northern Dancer circled the field with disdainful ease. Lang Crest and Grand Garcon now, and Northern Dancer moving up very fast on the outside. Going around the far turn, it's Grand Garcon and Northern Dancer. And now it's Northern Dancer on the outside, Grand Garcon in the center, and Lang Crest along the rail, and they're all going head and head with Northern Dancer now moving into the lead. Northern Dancer now by a length with Lang Crest on the inside and Grand Garcon. They have 3 sixteenths of a mile to come. And coming into the stretch, it's Northern Dancer. He's pulling away now. Northern Dancer in front by three or four lengths. Lang Crest is holding on to the second position. Grand Garcon is third on return trip. It's Northern Dancer. He moves out in front by eight lengths now with 70 yards to go. And coming down to the wire, Canada's great little horse, Northern Dancer, wins this was to be the dancer's final race. A tendon injury closed the book on a tremendous racing career. However, what closed the book on a career was to be the first page of a truly unbelievable story. Northern Dancer would go on to become the world's most influential stallion. The memory of Northern Dancer lives on with each generation of spirited champion. And it also lives on here at Woodbine life-size bronze statue of the dancer was unveiled on Canada Day of 1992. The statue, capturing that charismatic little horse at the peak of his productive years, overlooks the walking ring. And you know, it's as if Northern Dancer is casting even today an approving glance on the stars of another generation. And the magic of the old horse, who's been dead now a couple of years, still lives on. He just caught people's imaginations, young people, old people, whatever, and it's still there. Ali Deed, a great-grandson of Northern Dancer, was one of the first stars to come under the Dancer's gaze. A quote from King Haven Farms, paraded like a champion, then went out and raced like one in winning the 1992 Queen's Plate by some 12 lengths. They run to the 3 8 ball. On the inside, coming on now, that's Tannenberg. Tannenberg, Ali Deed, Paredes frozen on Ali Deed. He hasn't moved a muscle, and they glide up to take the lead. 
They come to the quarter pole. Alley deed. Now leads it by length. Grand Huey still second. Tannenberg beginning to back away. Starting to close between horses is Ben Burr, Bright Feather on the far outside. They come to the top of the stretch. Alley deed. Widens to four. Perret pushes the button. And Alley deed leaves a discouraged group of three-year-olds in his wake. They come to the 16th pole, and this Queen's Plate is history. Alley Deed in a class of his own, absolute domination. King Haven, owned by Bud and David Wilmot, has supplied Canadian racing with some of its most exciting performers. Performers quite literally seem to save their best for Queen's Plate Day. In 1989, Her Majesty Queen Mother Elizabeth celebrated the 50th anniversary of her first Queen's Plate visit and witnessed with approval romp to victory for King Haven. Three and Damascadan is up on the outside to take the lead. Wavewise sticks right with him. Most Valiant in behind them in third, splashing success. Just two lengths off the lead. Creed's making a move on the outside now from fifth. Blonde in a motel, going well at the rail in sixth. Stellar Knight, six lengths off the lead from seventh. Ivory Dance is eighth, Forum Fighter is ninth, with approvals being asked for run, he's gaining ground now. Ben Askar, Harry Larrick, Rear Admiral, and Tiganos and Lone Pine, and they're in the final three furlongs. It's Damasca Dan, splashing success, sticks ahead in front. It's splashing success as they come to the quarter pole. Damasca Dan's asked for all he's got by Sabarak, Creed is there, and with the approval, bursts onto the scene at the head of the stretch. It's splashing success, here comes Most Valiant, he's full of run, he shakes loose and he's gaining ground. It's Most Valiant at the eighth pole, with approval's going to try to chase him down to the inside, Damasca Dan. On the inside, it is Most Valiant, but with approval is strong, with approval and Most Valiant, they hit the wire together in a photo to win in a Queen's Plate. With approval went on to sweep the Prince of Wales and the Breeders, thus becoming the first Canadian Triple Crown winner since Canabora in 1963. That Triple Crown sweep was worth $1 million in bonus money from the Bank of Montreal. And you know, King Haven had another Bank of Montreal check to endorse in 1990. This time, it was his Vestia who did the honors. But his Vestia is accelerating. Seymour takes a peek over his shoulder, and his Vestia widens to three. Iskandar Lekbar is second, very foremost, putting an eight run on the far outside, but they come to the eighth pole, and his Vestia widens to ten. Iskandar Lekbar and very formal is Vestia, an absolutely brilliant performance. He crushes this field. That's because he earns it. Canada would take its hat off to a lady in 1991. Aunt Smartly, a rangy filly from Ernie Samuel Sampson Farms, captured the imagination of racing fans from coast to coast with her thorough domination. Aunt Smartly would win the Queen's Plate in a waltz. She then went on to become the first filly to win the Triple Crown. That, too, worth a million dollars, but there was more to come. She would win Woodbine's Molson Export Million. Then, the race of a lifetime, the Breeders' Cup distaff at Churchill Downs in Louisville. Dance Sparkly. Pat Day now is still motionless. She has yet to do her best running, but now there she goes. Dance Smartly with a sweeping move on the outside is coming toward the lead. Grand Girlfriend also kicks in. Queen is coming hard on the extreme outside now as the field comes down toward the final furlong. Brought to mind with a short lead. Dance Smartly is right there on the outside. Fit for a queen. Brave at the rail third. Here comes Versailles. Treaty was kicking in late, but it is Dance Smartly. She takes the lead under Pat Day's urging and pulls away here by two. It is Versailles Treaty, but it's too late and not enough. And it is Dance Smartly who strides under the line, undefeated this year, and the undisputed queen of racing on this continent. Royalty and racing go hand in hand here at Woodbine. Queen Mother Elizabeth has attended eight renewals of the Queen's Plate. After her first visit in 1939, she returned in 1962 to present the 50 guineas to Flaming Page's owner, E.P. Taylor. 
1965, she witnessed Whistling Sea from Western Canada emerge victorious. In 1974, Amber Herod made it two in a row for Jack Stafford. Her Highness presented Bud Wilmot with his first plate in 1979, won by steady growth. In 1981, Fiddle Dancer Boy would win for the late Jack Carmichael. And in 1985, it was the big filly from Winfield's La Lorgnette. Princess Margaret presented the distinctive Queen's Play trophy to Ernie Samuel in 1988. Regal intention, edging out stablemate Regal Classic. The Duke and Duchess of York were on hand one year earlier, when market control, the least likely part of the King Haven entry, rocketed from off the pace to upset the heavily favored a fleet. Her Royal Highness, Queen Elizabeth, has attended the Queen's Play twice. 1959, Her Majesty was escorted to the winner's circle by E.P. Taylor, who also accepted the Queen's congratulations after a brilliant performance by New Providence. And they have 3 sixteenths of a mile to go, and they come into the stretch. New Providence is in front by about three lengths. Winning shot is second, Mr. Rooster is third. Major flight now moving up on the outside. That's New Providence holding on to that lead by about three or four lengths. With major flight and winning shot on the outside, Sunday Sale in the center. And here they come to the finish line. It's going to be close, but it's New Providence win. New Providence wins the Kings Plate. New Providence becoming the first horse to sweep the Canadian Triple Crown. Queen Elizabeth would return here to Woodbine in 1973 and she congratulated Jack Stafford after his three-year-old Royal Chocolate splashed through a track with the consistency of a melted Hershey bar to win the plate. 1973 was truly a year to remember. Sandy Hawley rewrote the record book, becoming the first jockey in racing history to win 500 or more races in a single season. He easily eclipsed Bill Shoemaker's single season mark of 485 and finished the year with 515 winners. Yes, all of racing would turn its attention to Holly's ride to 515. That autumn, the world watched as the greatest horse of the century, perhaps of all time, Secretariat arrived here at Woodbine. The Golden Charger came to race for the final time in a career that was unparalleled in this sport. He came to contest the Canadian International, which now, of course, is known as the Rothmans International. And Secretariat knew he was something special. I remember those sunny fall mornings. He would actually come out and stop in front of the cameras. He was the king, and believe me, he knew it. And on those Indian summer mornings, time would stand still while he would take to the track to get. Several thousand fans waited for hours on the Friday morning before the race for Secretariat to have his final workout. Thick fog blanketed the course and had only begun to rise when you guessed it. Secretariat with Ron Turcotte up cantered down the Marshall Turf course, then switched gears and took off in full stride. It was truly an awesome performance. However, sadly, it was the last time Ron Turcotte would feel the power welling through his legs from this magnificent running machine. Turcotte was suspended later that afternoon by racing officials in New York City for what they deemed careless riding in a race a few days earlier. Eddie Maple would substitute. Sunday, October the 28th of 1973, and it seemed daylight would never come. When it did, thick black clouds raced with the wind, and heavy rain and sleet would lash the fans who began lining up outside the gates before 9 in the morning. They quite simply were not going to miss Big Red's final race. Here are. Kennedy Road comes away quickly on the outside to take the lead. And that is Secretariat now rushing up on the extreme outside to go into contention. As they swing into the far turn, Kennedy Road has the lead by a length and a half. Secretariat is second with Presidio coming on third. Babe Count is fourth along the inside. And now they're midway of the turn as Kennedy Road leads by about two and a half lengths with Secretariat running along second again with seven or eight lengths. 
with Presidio third. And coming into the stretch for the first time, they cross over the main track, and it is Kennedy Road on top. And here comes Secretariat on the outside. Kennedy Road leads by two and a half lanes. Secretariat is second, with Presidio running along third as Price Lucky moves up fourth. Dave Count is fifth. They did the half in 47 and two, and the six furlongs in 111 and three. And they're now heading into the clubhouse turn. It is Kennedy Road on top by a length and a half. Secretariat is second on the outside. Price Lucky is now third with Presidio four playing. They're coming on fifth on the outside. They count as six down the back stretch. Kennedy Road has the lead. Secretariat closing up alongside. Kennedy Road by a half a length. Secretariat is right there with him. A gap of seven lengths. Price Lucky third. Presidio four. And there he goes, there he goes, Secretariat on the outside, heading around the turn, Secretariat has the lead, Kennedy Road is second, Price Lucky is third, Presidio is fourth, it is all Secretariat, he's coming to the head of the stretch, and he now in front, by about six lengths with Kennedy Road second. The is Through the gloom of the late afternoon storm he came, steam belching from his nostrils like a freight train as he bore down in the wire. Those of us that were fortunate enough to be here, it was a day, a moment, and a race to remember for a lifetime. Secretariat's last race would set the stage for others to try the grass at Woodbine. How about this list? After Big Red came Dahlia, the flower of French racing, who blistered to a course record under Lester Piggott. Then came the Epsom Derby winner, Snow Knight. You a three-year-old who was called the Secretariat of France. All along, winner of the Arc de Triomphe. Yeah. She would go on to win in New York and Maryland and become the first European-based star to win a Horse of the Year title here in North America. European horses have dominated the Rothmans in recent years with such stars as River Memories in 1987, Infamy in 1988, and who can forget French Glory in 1990. Canada's Sky Classic, named North America's outstanding grass horse in 1992, would win one for the home side. His brilliant performance coming in 1991. They're tightly bunched into the far turn. The mile was in 37 and 3. 49er days. Now, Sky Classic forges to the front, midway of the turn. George Augustus runs at him from the hedge. They're inside the quarter pole. Sky Classic, George Augustus. McCarran has Bo Sultan running on the outside. They've entered the lane. Sky Classic by ahead on the inside. George Augustus goes to enough. Fight to the finish. Here comes Todd of Rum unleashing a run on the outside. It's Sky Classic. Bo Sultan. Here comes Panoramic for Steve Cawthon. They're running out of ground. Sky Classic hoists the flag. Canada's Sky Classic wins the Rothmans International. The world's winningest riders have also come here to Woodbine. Bill Shoemaker. Lafitte Pinkai Jr., Chris McCarran, Steve Coffin, Yves Saint Martin, Walter Swinburne, Canadian legend Johnny Longdon, Eddie Delahousse, and Kent DeZormo have added to the lore of Canada's showplace of racing. And in 1996, the racing world will converge in Woodbine for its championship day, the Breeders' Cup. Woodbine will host the first Breeders' Cup outside of the United States and take that international event to new heights. Maybe, just maybe, in that wonderfully imaginative mind of his, E.P. Taylor really knew that this day would eventually come. The Giant of the North, indeed.